Hello, listeners. Welcome to What Magic Is This? A podcast about magic, the occult, the esoteric, the paranormal, the supernatural, and the weird. My name is Douglas Batchelor, and today's show is about something I get asked about so often that, frankly, it gets kind of annoying. But no fear, this is why we are here. Today, we will be talking about something which might seem vast and labyrinthine in concepts and timelines, but we have help. In fact, we have the best of help. Today's topic is Rosicrucians and Rosicrucianism, and there is literally only one person, one person I want to talk to about this topic. So I crossed my fingers, sent an invite, and lo and behold, it all came together. Joining us to set us all straight is the author of the one and only book that I suggest for everybody who asks about this topic. The book, The Invisible History of the Rosicrucians. He is one of Britain's leading scholars of Western esotericism and an authority on Gnosticism, Hermeticism, Freemasonry, and so much more. I am beyond honored to welcome the one and only Tobias Churden. Tobias, how are you today? Well, I'm, I'm feeling a lot better after that, that magnificent introduction, which is, is uh, uh, I think the only thing I can do now is is die. Um, oh, well. well I, you, you've just written the obituary. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I, I truly hope not. I truly hope not. Let's, let's jump right in here because so many people have asked about this, this concept because, uh, yeah, it's one of those things where if you even start getting involved in Western esotericism, the name Rosicrucian is going to come up at some point very quickly. And uh, I'm going to read a little something here from the introduction to the invisible histories of the Rosicrucians, which says, much of Rosicrucian history has until recently consisted of little more than a perpetual and sometimes shameless accretion of mythology. You can write about Rosicrucianism as a series of or a collection of mythologies. So, Let's talk about mythology and truth. Much of what makes up Western esotericism and the occult is more mythological than factual. How is it that mythology is able to tell us more truths than factual truth itself? Uh, I think it was Bertolt Brecht um, who said that realism does not consist in reproducing reality, but in showing how things really are. And I think that is mythology is its best is an attempt to get inside the meaning of events, which by themselves may have no obvious meaning or mean different things to different people. Uh, a myth, a myth by, by what it is, is, is the memorable part of a series of events that cert certain people have over a period come to see as meaningful. The problem with mythology is while it encodes values from one period to another passed down as myth, uh, in the end, it's, it, it, or not even in the end, in the very early stages, especially with religious and spiritual mythology, um, the mythology, the myth itself becomes more powerful than the meaning. It's like a, it's like the idol. You can represent your god as as, an, as a, in a symbolic way, and use significant features in your idol. Uh, but you very much people start to end up worshiping the idol, not what it was you were. It's pointing to. Right. I think this is true with the history of enormous aspect of the Western, Western esoteric uh, so-called traditions is that uh, people are hooked on the mythology because it gets into the subconscious. It arouses uh, spiritual, inchoate spiritual needs that people have and formulates them in a memorable and, and magical way. I, it, it makes people constellate their own um, soul. Uh, and they read into these things, things of enormous personal significance. You could say, well, what's wrong with that? That's a kind of religion. Well, it's, it, it, it's all right. How far do you want to take it? And also, it always obscures the facts of the thing. So people end up with very unreal expectations. Yeah. And um, yeah. it, it's, uh, there are differences between different kinds of storytelling. Some of, I mean, you wouldn't call Jesus' parables, for example, myths. No. I mean, they, they might have allegorical elements, i.e. certain aspects of them may represent something else. But generally speaking, they're not mythological. They, are, they tend to be based on very homely, homely experiences that anyone knows about. The Good Samaritan getting mugged. Yeah? Um, the, the, the ungrateful son who leaves his father. These are things that really happen. Even though the 
the stories and the parables have, have a great spiritual meaning. He, Jesus always kept his parables down to, down to earth. And the problem with occult mythology is that there's a great will to get off the earth in the first place. So they, they never come down. <laughs> and uh, uh, this, is, this is confusing for anyone who's taking an interest who feels there's something in it, as I did when I was a young man. I had a feeling that magic was, was important. I mean, obviously, magic inspires uh, young people because it, in partly it's an escape from the hideous post-war modern experience um, where technology seems to be running away from us and our inner life seems to count for nothing and we're in danger of becoming a numerical digit on somebody else's computer and so on. And there's a soullessness in the scientific modern experience which draws people to a mythological world, which is why, you know, computer games evoking non-existent uh, empir imperial battles between uh, characters from a kind of King Arthurian type uh, thing are so popular. I mean, it, in other words, we've got we, what we're dealing with here is escapism. And But genuine occult knowledge or spiritual knowledge isn't escapist. It's actually about getting into the, uh, the depth of reality. And so you don't really... One of, one of the... Um, one of the architects of the Rosicrucian myth uh, described the people who got the wrong end of the stick. He called them the Little Curiosity Brothers. And this was in the mid 17th century. And I think you've got a lot of Little Curiosity Brothers today. And it's, in fact, Curiosity Brothering is an entire industry. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of money. There's always more money in the myth than the fact or the truth behind it. So while you can be Joseph Campbell and say, inspire the Star Wars. Um, uh, is it a trilogy or have they done 25 by now? I don't know. Is I've it, lost count. <laughs> no, how many Star Treks do you need to uh, before you've seen the final frontier? Right. It never gets there. You know? <laughs> yeah. but, uh, you, uh, you've got, you've got all, all this stuff. The, the, the stuff, that, the, generally speaking, the stuff that has very little meaning gets the most attention and is most enjoyable. Of course it is. Like, Fizzy, fizzy drinks full of sugar and pop and zing, 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 and it all goes up in the atmosphere. There's nothing to it. So what I wanted to do with my life's work, as it's turned out, I hate that phrase, life's work, because I'm still doing it. It's uh, not over. It's not over. And it's not over. But, but also it's, 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 it's overly serious. I took an interest in these things and found there was a lot that needed sorting out. And the, the Rose Christian book is the product of many years of sorting out fact from fiction and uh, also because uh, I, I had the experience of uh, encountering a major if you if that's, if that means anything a rosicrucian so-called organization uh, called the lectorium rosicrucianum who had a very fixed idea of what it all meant and uh, the guy who was really running that effectively saw something in me and i think he wanted me to promote it and we fell out because in the end i became critical of the myth. <laughs> right. So I, so I learned from personal experience what happens when people start taking the myth too literally or too, or in, in some respects too seriously. Yeah. There is a loss of sanity, which means about a healthy balance, yeah. seeing clearly. But of course, in the minds of such people, it's you, you're the outsider, you don't see, you don't see the great depth that this is all about and everything. How do you tell a fantasist they're a fantasist? Because a fantasist, is somebody for whom fantasy is reality. Very much so, yeah. Mm. So mythology is one of those things. I mean, I know Joseph Campbell uh, in his TV series all that years and years ago did please a lot of spiritually minded people because instead of dismissing legends, for example, historical legends and epics of daring do, instead of dismissing them as, oh, that's just fairy stories, he said, well, of course, these things actually encode uh, profound spiritual truths, and that's absolutely true to a point. Uh, but let's have more of the spiritual truths, say I, than the than the mythology that's true, that it very often obscures such truths. Here, here, definitely. Let's let's jump right in and ask the uh, the million dollar question here. What is Rosicrucianism, and who were the Rosicrucians? One at a time, basically. Both, both could do another book. <laughs> it's true. Third <laughs> question. What is Rosicrucianism? What is Rosicrucianism? Yeah. Well, I don't like any word that's got ism on the end. So yeah. 
uh, you know, what does it, why do, you, why do we add isms? Uh, John Lennon used to take the mick out of that. In Give peace a chance, prismism, kismism, ism, beerism, fatism, blackism. Uh, God, no, I don't know. I'm just, let, let, what is a Rosicrucian? What does it mean? I don't think there is such a thing as Rosicrucianism. Okay. It can't, that would suggest there was a, some sort of coherent doctrine that you could say accurately point thing and say that is a Rosicrucian doctrine. What has been, what's happened with a myth, the myth of Rosicrucians is that things have been attached to it rather like crustaceans underwater over many, many years. So you end, you've started with something very lovely, an, an oyster, say, right. which has its own beauty. And then something's got attached to the shell, and then something's got attached to that. And this whole glamorous jumbly is called Rosicrucianism. Well, one, and to try and get to the essence of what this is, you have to remove all these isms in the country centre, and you end up with something very beautiful and very simple. So what is a Rosicrucian? Uh, well, today, a Rosicrucian is somebody who, who is involved and feels personally involved with this conglomerate ideas called Rosicrucianism. Right. Uh, but if we go back to the originators of the concept, uh, which we'll have to, and I'll, be, I'll have to be more specific, if you uh, identify with the invisible fraternity RC, which is the proper name for it, um, you never say so. You don't say so. So anyone who says I'm a Rosicrucian has got the wrong end of the stick straight away. And even to call an organization Rosicrucianism is, even within the old occult uh, uh, language of the 19th century, was thought of as very bad, uh, bad form for anyone who's, who's fairly enlightened. Right. Um, it's just not something you would claim for yourself because, uh, 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 shall we say, it's, uh, you, don't, you don't choose to be a Rosicrucian. <laughs> you, according to the mythology, you are, you are a selected as such. And uh, with that selection goes the first rule of masonry, which is shut up. Right. Now, where does the term come from? Originally, there's no, even the word Rosicrucian is a mixture of some Latin. In the first account of there being a fraternity, it was always called the Fraternity RC. But we never are told in the uh, first writings, which first appear historically in the year 1610 in a manuscript that was circulating in the Tyrol in Switzerland um, and uh, in Austria. This manuscript describes that there has been a discovery of the tomb of Freighter R.C. We don't know what R.C. means. Uh, you know, it's never said. And they, they, their seal was always R.C. That was, that's the seal of membership of the order. It's never explained. It's only later that people presume that R.C. meant Rosenkreuz. And that is because in 1616, a pirate version of a story written by a, a, a wonderful German theologian called Johann Valentin Andrei, who's really the author of the whole thing. A pirate version of his story came out and it came under the, the title in German, Chemische Hochzeit, Chemical Wedding, or von Christiani Rosenkreuz. Now, they saw, people saw this Christiani Rosenkreuz, Christian Rosy Cross, Rosy Cross, and they thought, well, that's what I see meant. But in fact, there's, there's been, never been anybody uh, officially say that. It, it was not meant to be any more than, than an acronym. Right. Um, so even the term Rosicrucian, which is just a anglicization of a Latin Rose Crucis, Rosy Cross, is, 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 a bit, is a bit fake. And also to suggest there's a body of doctrine which is Rosicrucian. Well, anyone can set up an organization, write down some things that they believe strongly and say that that is Rosicrucianism. That's pretty well what's happened with Amork, the... Uh, mystical order that, that, that Harvey Spencer Lewis founded at the beginning of the early 20th century. You know, and there are other competing Rosicrucian orders that was climbed as an order uh, based up in North Philadelphia, I think, I forget which state it was operating in. Uh, and then you get competing Rosicrucians. Then you have the great Rosicrucian war in Paris in the 1890s between uh, Joseph Van Pelledin and his um, uh, Order of the triple order, triple intellectual order of of the Grail and the Temple, which is, I think, the best form of Rosicrucian thing ever because he, he knew extremely well what he was doing. 
he didn't think for a minute he was trying to refound an order. He wanted to he wanted to create an aesthetic movement in arts to revolutionise yeah. aesthetic sensibility in Europe, and he did wonderful. But meanwhile, there was the Kabbalistic order of the Rosy Cross, founded uh, by Pelada himself, uh, but along with uh, the Marquis uh, uh, Dalteil, uh, Stanislas de Gaeta, who's a wonderful poet, and he wanted to just set up an organised magical order which would give out a kind of baccalaureate, uh, a degree, so you could take a degree in magical studies. It never got into the Sorbonne, but that was the aim. He said that all this occult knowledge needs to be codified and, and turned into an exam system. I think it's a great shame that's never really happened. No. There was a kind of English, uh, English attempt to do the same thing, by McGregor, so-called McGregor, Samuel Little Mathers, with Westcott, uh, in the and um, and Woodman in the in the eighteen eighties. They tried to set, they they didn't try. They set up an order called the uh, Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, which had many uh, rosy cross mythological images in it. And in fact, the central initiation ceremony was in fact the resurrection. You are raised with Christian rosy cross from the tomb. Right. Uh, in a spiritual sense. And this tomb was made of wood and was in Blythe Road, Hammersmith, which is now a motorway flyover. And just <laughs> to bring it, bring it down to earth a bit. Right. They, were, they had a war, they had a massive battle in 1900, the police were called. There's one group and another tried to get hold of this tomb of Christian Rosenkreuz, which had been made by a carpenter and painted a few years before. It gives you an idea of how, how we can get this all this stuff. And you start to take it seriously. But Mathers claimed on no basis at all that his order stemmed from the original order. Well, folks, there was never an original order. And that is one of the wonderful things about the Rosicrucian story. What was happening in and around Europe, particularly Central Europe, at the end of the uh, the 16th century and the early 17th century when the idea of Rosicrucianism starts to, to solidify? What was going on? Uh, well, again, I'm going to correct that. The, I, there was no idea of Rosicrucianism, so it, it couldn't even do it. But, so that's really a later conception. Now, if you don't like history, you won't like what I'm about to say. If you're interested in old history and you've got a feel for it, then you probably will. And if you really know your history, then you, what I say won't be a surprise. The 16th century uh, gave the world, the uh, Western world particularly, what we call the Reformation. And without the Reformation, the United States of America would not exist uh, in anything remotely like the, uh, the form it does. And, and everything would have been very, 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 very different. And you would have been speaking Spanish in Canada, fiddling with a rosary, maybe. <laughs> Europe was split by the Reformation. And by the early 17th century, it was hoped that there was going to be a reform, a second Reformation, a reform, which would undo some of the damage that Luther's rebellion of fifth, beginning in 1517 at Wittenberg in Germany, some of the damage, which was this horrendous, violent split between the Catholic Church and, and mostly the Calvinists and, and uh, the Lutherans, Lutherans mainly in Germany, Calvinists in Switzerland and also in France, and none of whom could disagree on what Jesus' religion really demanded of people. They disagreed on Christology, they disagreed on the nature of Holy Communion, they disagreed on who was going to be saved, they disagreed on what were the primary doctrines, and all, the, and all of them killing in the name of Jesus Christ. And do you remember that line in the film Cromwell, where Cromwell, this is the film version of Cromwell, not the real one, right. uh, he, says, he says, Mr. Ireton, everyone who wages war believes God is on his side. I'll wager God must often wonder who is on his. That problem of what was godly and Christian became acute for a group of theologians in Tübingen uh, in southern Germany who looked at the, there was, a, there was a celebration in Tübingen in 1617, a hundred years of freedom, they declared, and there was bunting all around the city as Luther's first rebellion uh, against uh, papal indulgences, um, as they were called. Well, an indulgence meant that an, one of the Pope's officers would come to your town and sell for money forgiveness for certain sins. And the bigger the sin, the more money you had to pay. And this money went to build St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This was the cause of the, the initial cause, so should we say, the spark that led to Luther's 
rebellion and putting up his famous uh, 95 Theses in Wittenberg, which, which was immediately used by the local princes of, of the various states of Germany as a means of getting out of church control. In other words, the Reformation served, in the end, the interests of the leaders of states. It was to their advantage. Thus, in England, for example, you have the problem of Henry VIII wants a divorce. And so he promotes a, a, a rebellion of, of in the church to, to get it. When he can't get it, that is, he, he starts to favour, which he'd never done before, he starts to favour the Lutheran doctrines because Lutheran clergymen told him, yes, you can have a legal divorce so you can marry Anne Boleyn and divorce your Catholic wife, Catherine of Aragon. And uh, so the Reformation very quickly became a political tool. Europe by 1600 was split wide open and on the verge of another major war. Um, the Catholic Church had tried to reform itself in the, in the, in the Council of Trent, but in fact had become even more um, uh, doctrinaire than it, than it had been previously. Meanwhile, the Protestant states were all on edge that they were going to be invaded by vast Catholic armies. The Habsburgs regarded themselves as the crusaders for the Pope. And as I say, that many of the problems we have today in the, in the English-speaking world and uh, Europe come from this point. What is little known is, is the reaction of some people to this. And the, the people that interest me are three theologians from Tübingen, Johann Valentin André, a young idealist, very interested in alchemy, but also very interested in politics and how religion relates to politics. His friend Christoph Besold, who was a, a legalist, he was a professor of law, but he was an expert on Eastern religions, which was pretty rare in those days. He was an Orientalist and had a, an amazing library uh, uh, based in, in Stuttgart, uh, which André used to visit. And uh, then there was another man, a remarkable fellow around too big, and his name was Tobias Hess. And Tobias Hess was, no, I'm not obsessed, that's an unfair word. He was a great devotee of the religious writings of Paracelsus. Paracelsus really is what most people think is Rosicrucianism. Paracelsus was the first man to introduce, um, if I remember, he's born in 1484 or 1494, uh, memory served, died about 1541. So he's quite a few generations before André. I mean, he's born 40 years before André is born. By which time, um, Paracelsus' religious writings had started to be published. Now, when in his lifetime, he didn't dare publish his religious writings because they criticised um, all religious figures as, and, and as well as the, uh, the med medicine system. He was the first person to introduce chemistry into into medicine drugs in other words and used alchemy and old wives tales and first person to do a, a, a paper on an industrial disease uh, when he had to heal heal the miners of the hearts mountains uh, a most remarkable genius full of magic uh, he believed that magic uh, held as a tradition held keys to health because he believed that the human body is connected to the entire universe uh, all the time and whereas in modern philosophy, we tend to see everything as objective. And if there isn't a causal link between one object and another, we, we generally speaking, philosophically, we, we deny there can be such an influence. Uh, but tell that to the tides when the moon is near the Earth. But they would say, oh, well, that's a gravitational pull, et cetera, et cetera. OK, right. you know about gravitational pull from the sun, uh, from the thing. What other influences do you think might come from the sun? And the fact that the sun at any particular time is relatively in another relation to other uh, heavenly bodies, as we call them. Now, there was traditional knowledge of astrology. Paracelsus absorbed this. Now, Tobias Hess, the great friend of the first author of the, what's called the first Rosicrucian Manifesto, I say it's called that, that's not what it was called at the time. Tobias Hess was a great fan of Paracelsus religious writings. He saw them as spiritually revolutionary, and he thought that they were the key to uh, solving the problem of the Reformation. And he influenced, to some extent, Johann Valentin André, who was a Lutheran theologian, uh, who was quite a wild kid, and, and he was uh, got into trouble. He was kicked out of university for, he, for writing lewd poems about uh, various of the leaders of the university whose wives he thought were strumpets. <laughs> he was a fine old man. 
And uh, he later grew into a much more responsible person. With, and I think he was always heading to be a responsible person. At the time he writes the first so-called manifesto, it's not a manifesto, um, on the fraternity uh, RC. He's playing with ideas because he loved theatre. He was very keen on the, what he called the English players, very keen on, on things like Shakespeare's plays. And he realised that the, 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 the theatre, the stage, could be a wonderful teaching, uh, teaching method. You could get over profound truths and stories to people very quickly through theatre. Now, this is the context in which you've got to understand the original story that launches what we call out Rosicrucianism. He wrote an account. Uh, all, all lines point to him being the, the author. Whether he was authoring it in cahoots with the other two fellows or other people, we can't say. But he, 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 is, he invented Christian Rosenkreutz. We know this because we have a document from 1606 where he talks makes a list of his early youthful teenage writings, and one of them is Kimisha Hochzeit, or The Chemical Wedding. Mm -hmm. So we, we know that, he, that he's, he, he's, he's capable of writing a profound religious spiritual allegory. And an allegory is what the Rosen R.C. story is. You have a, a monk. The story is the monk is uh, in a German monastery, that he's dissatisfied with the religion. And after the... the extraordinary period in the 15th century when there were two popes, rival popes, one in Avignon and one in Rome, which is really the first split, in a way, in, in the edifice of the Roman Imperium, the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, he, go, he leaves the West and he goes to the East. He goes to a place called Damkar, uh, it says in the English translation. In fact, the place is Damar, but there was a misunderstanding of a, of a map, I think, by Ortelius. Anyway, he goes to Damar. Now, Damar was known as a university, and it's in what we now call Yemen in the east. And when he arrives at this university, and the, the date is in the 15th century, the 1400s, so it's before Columbus. It's dated about 20 years before Columbus is uh, trying to find India through the Atlantic um, and bumped into America, as it all parts of uh, some of the islands anyway. <coughs> the Caribbean didn't quite get to America, if I remember right. No. No, he, but he met some Caribs. Didn't he? And, uh, yeah. Anyway, it opened the door. But he didn't get to India. Never. He never got to India. Well, Christian, uh, sorry, I must stop saying that. Brother C.R. Uh, goes to Damar in Arabia. He meets the sages and they tell him things that he says are completely unknown in Europe, Christian Europe. Now, these are Muslims. These are mystical teachers of, of a magic, the like of which he'd never encountered. And after going to Damar, and he said they greeted him as one long expected, very like the Thief of Baghdad story, if you remember your lovely old movie, when he arrives and says, we are the relics of the golden age, gold, golden because gold was nothing, no more than the sand beneath your feet. This is the kind of fantasy setting that he discovers in Arabia. Love it. So uh, he then goes to Fez, and he says at Fez he learns about the elementary inhabitants. Now, the elementary inhabitants means they believed at that time that the, that um, the uh, elements, the earth, air, fire, and water, uh, were represented by beings in nature. So you had undines uh, were the spirits of water, uh, sylphs are the spirits of the air, gnomes the spirits of the earth, and salamanders are the spirits of fire. So you always, in any Rosicrucian writing, you will always get pictures of salamanders and sylphs and this sort of thing. Uh, the idea being that there's a secret knowledge of how to use the inner spiritual aspect of nature, and that's a very important part of the early mythology. This is greeting nature as a spiritual reality, and that is one of the great attractions of, of, of the myth that he starts with. Anyway, see, Brother C.R., having learnt loads, a bit like Marco Polo, comes back to Europe, and surprise, surprise, nobody wants to listen. They all think he's not easy has nothing to offer. They don't want any of this new knowledge. And having failed to turn on the, um, the, the, the savants, the, the, the knowing people, the academics of Europe, Germany, partic Germany particularly, uh, he, he decides to do something about it. Now, just a quick thing about this. André was a great critic, an acerbic critic of the German university system. And that's very strong in the, in the first uh, so-called manifesto which is called Pharma Fraternitatis, means the fame of the fraternity. 
And the fame of the fraternity is an irony because, in fact, the fraternity is unseen by the world. It's not recognized. Brother C.R. decides to form a kind of invisible club. Uh, and he gathers together some followers, a few followers, and they agree to meet once a year in the Arabic bowl to discuss whatever each one of them has discovered in fields of science, whether it be in medicine or in understanding of theology or cosmosophy or astronomy or whatever it is. They meet mostly to do with healing of the body. That's a very, very important point. The emphasis of the, uh, the first rose, rose Cross stories are about healing and doctors. It's doctors and healing connected with spiritual understanding. That's, that's, the, that's the original core notion that interests Andre. They agree to meet every year, and eventually CR succumbs at a very great age. I think he's 106 when he dies, if I remember right. And, um, and they bury him in a secret place. It's all very symbolic and a, a wonderful uh, tomb. We're surrounded by symbolic geometry. Right. Um, but then he says, I, and he, he dies in about, uh, if I remember right, I think the date would be roughly 1476. Absolutely, oh, four is the four. I forget. It's a, it's a significant date anyway. Right, 16, 84, isn't it? 1484, of course it's 1484. 1484. It's the birth date of Paracelsus. There you go. <laughs> That's when he's buried. Now, they said, it says in the in the, in the Arm of Fraternity Artists that, that they, the brethren met uh, and always remembered Father C.R. He's always called then Father C.R. But they'd forgotten where he's buried. But one of them, in the year 1604, is doing some reparations, doing some repairs to his building. Now, this is an allegory. What he means is he's exploring his inner soul, his meditating. And he finds a a nail stuck in the wall. And he pulls out this nail and the wall starts to collapse. And inside they find this incredible truth. I mean, it, and this is all presented in the document as if it's happening or just happened very recently. And they come together and they, and they explore it and they find his body, Father C.R.'s body, whole and unconsumed in a, an amazing tomb with the book M. Clutching, clutch to his breast, and the true Kabbalah, and all kinds of symbols around. And they take this as a sign that a new light is about to dawn on Europe. Now, it just so happens that 1604 is the date of uh, Trigonus Igneous, uh, new stars in, in a fiery triangle in, in the heavens, and uh, a supernova, in fact, was recorded by Kepler who wrote a book about it, who said, Kepler, the first person to realize that planets went around the sun in an ellipse, um, he said there would be all kinds of astrological effects of this, uh, including possibly wars or a new religion. So you have the chiming in, the timing of this story coming out, chimes in with this new apocalyptic, in the true sense of the word apocalyptic, which I'll explain in a second, uh, an apocalyptic expectation and the whole thing starts to come together and when this when this document which was circulated for for to get a reaction as a manuscript when it's printed in 1614 in castle starts a kind of na uh, international excitement very much like as if you know some alien civilization had landed you know and so forth it, it, it was really an incredible event what do i mean by apocalyptic the original apocalypse is uh, which means to bring out of hiding apocalypsis. Uh, it doesn't mean this Hollywood idea of the end of the world, you know, tidal waves, tsunamis, and all the rest of this stuff, everything bad. The apocalyptic, the apocalyptic movement was, was set up to encourage people who thought that God didn't care about the, the world or justice anymore, that the evil men would have the whole sway. And so the early apocalyptic writings, which we can date, the first ones in the second century BC, were meant to cheer Jews up that, uh, that despite their suffering um, and persecution and, and the, the, their um, suppression by every neighbouring state, uh, that the good thing was going to happen. And that's what an apocalypse is. It's meant to be good news. So uh, there was this notion that Christ would, would, there would be a period of, of, of so many years 
when all secrets of nature will be revealed. And this is referred to in the first Rosicrucian document, the Pharma Fraternitatis, that there's going to be a great light and a tremendous enlightenment. Well, of course, let's chat with Andre knew perfectly well that early 17th century Europe was going through a scientific revolution, which within a century would transform uh, the understanding of independent researchers in universities all over Europe. It was, it's the beginning of the modern age. We're going to have Isaac Newton, the Royal Society, all these things start to, start to take shape uh, with new freedom. So there is a prophetic power within the pharma fraternitatis, but it's not some supernatural prophecy. It's because André was an extremely sharp guy, could see the way things were going, and what he wants to do is encourage how do we get all this new learning which has come around with the Renaissance? How do we bring it all together and create this true reformation? And the purpose of his writings and all his books subsequently, André's writings, was to cause what he called the second reformation of the spirit. That you'd had a reformation of the of the law around the church, i.e. people were released from, many people were released from papal control, cardinals control, they were released from the Inquisition. They had simply been handed over to what, however benign the state felt, who then appointed its own state churches. And of course, then you got, as a reaction to that, all these little conventicles, every kind of Baptist, Anabaptist freak show. I mean, so many of these groups went to America where, you know, Anyone, it seems to me, can wear a dog collar and call himself priest, bishop, or whatever church he, he likes, you know, and um, set up in a shack in Arizona and, and preach, preach the gospel to the guy, you know, like Jesus, Jesus. That's uh, right. You know, this all comes out of this period of reaction to the Reformation. Now, Andre's reaction to these ref reformist catastrophes which had occurred in Europe is, I'd say, hugely enlightening. And his, his writings influenced, the most important people they influenced were people like Comenius, who, um, who started with an edu a reformer of education, and um, people in England, mathematicians, who were very keen. And it, I mean, it spread throughout Europe. Uh, everybody who was anybody read the Rosicrucian Manifestos. The only places when they were, where they were regarded as dangerous and heretical, particularly, mainly was in Italy, the, in the Catholic parts of the world, but there was a big reaction also in Lutheran Germany. They said, this, this, this isn't Lutheranism. There's something funny going on here. Right. This is, I'll tell you what this is, they say. This is Paracelsianism. Oh. And they didn't call it Paracelsianism because no one wanted to insult Paracelsus by this period. So they called it Weigelianism. Uh, Valentin Weigel was a German mystic fascinating man whose writings really about about the free spirit uh people today would love him he, he would have fitted perfectly into the summer of love uh, we wouldn't have needed guru if we'd had valentin weigel and paracelsus we wouldn't have needed gurus from india let's put it that way Amazing. they'd have turned on america in five minutes and that uh, god knows what would have happened hallelujah but anyway you, you're getting the drift now so there's an original movement there's an original movement of some very great thinkers who are trying to create a piece of theatre which would engage interest in how to reform Europe, how to reform its knowledge system, its universities, how to reform its religion and bring people truly together in Christian love, and how to reform arts and sciences. So you've got this view that all these things are really should be part of one thing. And the, the, the word at the time that was coined by Nicholas Kamensky or Comenius, as he was known, who was a wonderful uh, uh, man who came to Germany at and, and became friendly with Andre. What he wanted to do was, uh, he called it Pan Sophia, which means the universal wisdom. So he wanted all these new knowledge to be integrated for the spiritual uplifting of man to return human beings to a divine status or to set him on that path. Now, certain aspects of this uh, movement are still with us in things like UNESCO, which was also which was an inspiration of it, but also in in various kinds of religion, the Schwenkfeldians you've got in Germany, in America, they, they went over there. You know, there are spiritual there are spiritual implications that come out of this ferment. Um, but it starts with a fakery. It starts with a hoax. It, it, the Rosicrucian story is a hoax. I'd say it's the most brilliant hoax of all time. I think it even beats Orson Welles's War of the Worlds uh, broadcast, 1939. It, I think it's a, a masterpiece hoax. There is something, I'd say, in my own 
in a loose way, don't take this too literally, I'd say there's something rather divine about it. Mm -hmm. Except that, of course, at the same time as you have these very positive reactions, you also produce a lunatic fringe who start conglomerating in the second and third generation and then produce something entirely of their own, which I suppose might go under the name of Rosicrucianism, which is basically uh, attaches itself to early Freemasonry and produces various kinds of neo, what are called neo Rosicrucianism. And, and neo Rosicrucianism is the source of much of what today passes as the occult. Nice. More cynical historians would call the initial release of the manifesto is what we call the manifestos. They would call it like a, a joke. There's a, what is it? A lubridium or a... Ludibrium. Yeah. Ludibrium. Lude, you know the word lewd. Uh, ludus is a joke. Yeah. Yes. Uh, André called it a ludibrium. His right. word. Yeah. He meant it's a serious joke. In other words, look, this is a performance. This is a theatre. And you've been invited to play parts in it. And what he, he and at one point after the, the whole thing had got out of hand, and people were claiming to be Rosicrucians, like some would claim to have been abducted to Venus and taught the secrets, you know, very much the same thing. They'd been said they were taken in by these brothers, and there were all these stories going around. Because it, it because they misunderstood the allegory, they thought Rosicrucians were invisible. And because of that, they must be, and of course, the Catholic Church then said, ah, oh, they're uh, worshippers of Satan. It's come from Germany, it's Protestant, it's satanic. Now that again gets attached to it, yeah. right? So, and uh, over a period of time, you know, there's, this whole thing conglomerates. Now, uh, and so many people have had been influenced by this tradition well or badly over, over the years. The reason I wrote, did the study was to make sure in the future nobody could nobody could be under the wrong impression unless they really wanted to be. Right. <laughs> because read that book and you'll get the facts. And I haven't had one uh, person come to me and say, this, it, you've got it wrong. It's created a kind of... Yeah. Well, you know, you know what I mean? It's, it, it, they know it's there, but it's like, we can't discuss it because this guy knows more about it than we do. <laughs> and if they bothered to find out uh, what I was happy to be shown and uh, found out for myself, they, their minds would have to change. Yeah, for sure. But not necessarily. I know, for example, there's a this guy I know in Holland uh, for whom all of this has simply proved to him that it was even more divine than he thought. You know, he's sort of, a, he's sort of accommodated all this scholarship, but for him it's the proof that the whole thing was truly out of this world. Only, only you know, uh, incredible kind of magic could have, spiritual magic could have generated this, this thing at all. Once you really understand it, you know, it's very interesting. That's why Jesus said you can't put new wine in old wine skins. Or as a friend of mine said, you can't put new wine in old winos. <laughs> I don't know about that. But <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people come from the Rosicrucian idea of there being, as Dame Francis Yates said, a Rosicrucian enlightenment. Now, um, I understand that this book is is fairly, as it was for you, it was fairly influential because it, it, it does light a bit of a spark, but how has uh, Dame Francis Yates's uh, hypothesis fared these days? Yeah. Dame, Dame, well, she wasn't a day when she wrote it at all. Um, no. Francis, she was at LMH, uh, I used to have tutorials there. Um, Francis Yates wrote that book. It came out in 1972 which is a sort of key date because it's the transition from the 60s to the 70s and it caught into uh, some of the intellectual hippies like Michael Bajant, who later did The Holy Blood and The Holy Grail, who's really the great disciple of that book. Uh, but there are quite a lot of disciples of that book because that book has been taken really as a religious text. Yeah. Because he, she, what she managed to do was to, she dug out some of the history and made, made a meaning of it which justified to people who are interested in, in magic and so forth, it justified, it gave it a historical reality that they'd not really been able to get the hand on before. And because she was academic, uh, it gave it academic status. And of course, I think it's a marvelous book because it really upset the enemy. You know? yeah, <laughs> they didn't right. like it. I, I remember speaking to the, she used to teach at the Warburg Institute in London. I, I, 
uh, just after she died, I remember speaking to the current head. He said, of course, we've got to get over the Francis Yates experience. You know? <laughs> they were very worried that, that she introduced um, sound, uh, dull academicism into something freaky and magical, uh, which they were very embarrassed about because, of course, uh, technically, post-war Britain, the only magic is, uh, I suppose you say, it was Glastonbury Festival, or you say it was tourists, you know, King Arthur. Right. Uh, all of that stuff, but there's no there's no magic in the in the British education system, state or universities, and she was bringing magic back into academe, and so the book was resented. So I don't like to attack that book because I could see that it it, it had a, an immensely interesting effect. But in terms of her research, well, we've discovered far more that she that she did with what she was available at the time. She did a, a damn good job. We've had some amazing scholars, one in particular, Carlos Gilly, since then, he's a Spanish scholar who was pay paid for by Joost Rittman, who ran the uh, Biblioteca Philosophica Hermetica in Amsterdam, which I was associated with for 10 years. He was financed to go through the libraries of Europe and discover everything about the early documents that re responded to the Thama. And he did a wonderful job on that in a wonderful book called Caemilia Rhodostoratica, but because when Mr. Rittman at the time seemed to be anti, went through an anti-English phase, I think he, he didn't like Margaret Thatcher's anti-European stance, uh, the book was only published in German, which is a tragedy because the book, you know, if you, if you, luckily I have German friends and, and translated a lot of it myself, but my German's not very good, uh, but it's not available in, in English. Uh, it's a tragedy because it's a major text. It's terribly, terribly important. Uh, if you think the Rosicrucian story, so-called, is important, which I certainly do, I think I used to call it the greatest story ever told because it reveals, actually, if you get into it, uh, something very, very authentically true about Christ's spirit in the world, not in the sense you would get it from churches or evangelical preaching or Bible study, but it reveals it in a, in a completely refreshing way. It's basically about the, the spiritual nature of truth. That's what was inspiring Andre for him, as for me personally, truth is itself a spiritual experience. And uh, to seek the truth is to, to live the life of the spirit. Or as Dean Ng said, uh, reason is a gift of the spirit, which is the right way to think of it, I think. You don't have to be anti-rational. Uh, reason, reason is one of the tools that, that the sense of truth enlightens, but reason by itself, mechanical reason, will never get you to the source of reason. For sure. Which is why so much philosophy today taught to schools, just anyone who does it comes out of it with the feeling they've just gone up their own backside, come out the other side, and no, you know, there's nothing left to say. <laughs> you know, thanks to Mr. Wittgenstein and, and his non-philosophers non of Cambridge, um, there you go, that's my own personal view, of course. And it probably means I won't be invited into the Royal Academy this year. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> There's this idea that the Rosicrucian mythos has that goes back to something like a perennial philosophy. Michael Meyer said, like, this Rosicrucian... Michael, this Michael Meyer knew nothing. He was, he, was, he, was a, he was a physician. He's a Paracelsian physician. Uh, he used alchemy to make remedies. His books are basically a, an apotheosis of alchemy. That's what he's interested in. He believed that alchemy had the key to all the Greek myths and that all the major Greek myths were allegories of al actual alchemical uh, recipes. He just used the fame of the, of the Rosicrucians in the, in, the late 70, in the late 16 um, teens and in the 1620s to sell his books on, on alchemical medicine. Uh, but he didn't. He didn't know Andre. He wasn't involved with the people who, who founded it. Francis Yates says he's the most. He's the deepest of the, the deepest of the Robert Rosicrucians. This, this is one of the biggest jokes of Francis Yates' book because it just what it actually means is she never read in detail uh, of Michael Meyer book because uh, when you get to grips with Meyer, what Meyer was writing about, it, he's writing about medicine and alchemy. He's not interested in the least in in what Andre is interested in. And uh, she just didn't understand that because she, you know, it looked it looked deep to her at a superficial level. 
But that one of the things about France is that she did rather claim to have access to uh, understanding of books, in fact, that I, I don't think she'd ever read in the original languages. One of the problems with studying this period is that nearly everything is written in Latin. And if you haven't got a friendly translator, uh, you're, you're in deep, deep uh, poo with, the, with, the, with this stuff because not, almost none of the key texts have been translated. And those that, even the key texts have been translated badly. Yeah. Uh, for example, the, the, in her book, the, the translation of the farmer, uh, which is a British translation done in the 1650s, is very poor uh, translation of the German. And this is one of the... It, what, what she really didn't understand was that this was a German movement made for Germans, primarily. It had a universal meaning, obviously, or it wouldn't have been taken on by people in Sweden, Poland, Czechoslovakia, or it wasn't Czechoslovakia then, of course, but Emia, you know, Austria, Northern Italy, even some Spanish people were interested, probably got... Uh, um, tortured for it, uh, France, uh, and even over in the, 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 the early settlements in America, the, uh, there are early uh, people who are interested in this material. You know? So she got that wrong, but it doesn't matter because what she, her book did, as her book on Giordano Bruno in 1964, Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, she opened this up to serious scholarly interest, which hadn't happened in the English language until then. All of the books on these themes and Gnosticism were all written by theosophical uh, enthusiasts and are coloured by it. So she, I think she, she, her, her actual contribution is much bigger than the, necessarily the content of some of the books. But she opened it up, and, and I think, I think that's that's one of the greatest things. It's like the Beatles opened it up for Stones and, and everybody else, and, yeah. you know, and uh, got people to listen to Chuck Berry who probably never would have listened to Chuck or Jerry Lee or any of these things, whatever you may or may not think of the Beatles, they open that bloody door, yeah. you know, and some very good things have come out of it. Definitely. I know that because I spoke to Roger Waters of Pink Floyd about it personally. There you go. <laughs> I, I got, in fact, I got him to sing Across the Universe, one of my favourites. Oh, nice. <laughs> Beatle numbers. But... Uh, there is a, of course, there's, a, there's always a magical connection with the 60s and the Beatles. Absolutely. I did write a book about that as well. <laughs> the Spiritual Meaning of the 60s, it's called. And it's, my, it's one of my very favorite books. Oh, wonderful. Very much, much, very much from the heart and uh, full of the magic that ordinary people can do when, when they get access to the right kind of information or sometimes the wrong kind of information. <laughs> Uh, the trouble today is, is most of the uh, you're, you're an obvious exception, but most most of the stuff that's coming through on the net is just garbage. Yes, and, and you, it's not fair to you. Can hardly expect people who are not trained in these subjects yeah. to be able to tell easily the difference between you know a healthy chip and, and something that's just pure fat. Yeah. Sorry, I mean you say French fries. Don't you? In Canada. <laughs> We, yeah, we say French fries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, we say chips. Right? We, I love the chips. I, I, I distinctly think chips are different. Yeah. Chips are chips are. I've been yeah. I've been to England. Chips are different than French fries. French fries are they're overly fried. Very, 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 very. <laughs> I think the um, what we have <laughs> now, as as Jake Stratton Kent has said, is that Western occultism isn't in good shape, but it's got a very busy marketplace right now. <laughs> That's nice. I yeah. Hope it's, uh, yeah. You know, Nothing's in good shape, uh, is it, uh, really? Um, there are those of us who are like, I, I feel like um, like a racehorse ready to run, ready to go, you know? and the bloody barrier won't go up. That won't go up. <laughs> I think, have I got to just go and grab it and lift it up myself? Why not? There's there's room for that. Where do I start? How do I get the grips of the barrier? Right. You know, where do we do? Well, I try with my writing and this sort of, this sort of thing. It's very hard, uh, it's very hard. Uh, the, the tragedy in the Western world for, for the kind of things we're talking about, where there is a real, there is a hugely creative impulse that exists in the magical tradition. There is. Uh, as long as you don't just, uh, it, a lot of people, it's just a side road. It, it, it either leads nowhere or it takes you away from normal. So that's good. That's why we want to be there and we don't want to come out of it. Right. Uh, to me, I want to see magical ideas, magical thinking, and magical thinkers in the mainstream. Me too. That's where I want to see them, you know, and uh, 
because because we it, the, the true magician was always the creative impulse. Everything that the Sony and all these dreadful companies make huge amounts of money for was done by people who had no money and who were working in their imagination or with books or from the heart or whatever. And because of a magical, there was a door open in the 60s. There's no doubt of it. It was shut very quickly, but it opened. Yeah. There was a door open in the early 1600s, and it was shut pretty quickly. The third so-called manifesto, which is the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz, which isn't a manifesto of any kind. It's a, it's a magical story. I wanted to make a movie of it. George Lucas should do it instead of those sci-fi things. I mean, okay, if you like that sort of stuff, you like it. Right? Right. I, first, I can't believe in unbelievable stories. That's my trouble. You know? oh, even, if, even if they have mythological and spiritual elements, rather obvious ones. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I do think industrial light and magic should be... It's time they worked on a magical subject. I mean, truly magic. And they, they steer clear of it all the time. Yeah. Kenneth Anger tried to make magical alchemical movies and I think showed aspects of how it could be done. Uh, there was another amazing guy in New York. I've forgotten his name. Um, he used to live in the Chelsea Hotel. Oh, in the 60s. Incredible. All, all his films he made, he made them by hand. They were incredible. Painted each frame. Stand incredible. Back. No. No, it wasn't him. He knew him. They were part of the okay. scene. Anyway, he, uh, his stuff was destroyed by his, because he couldn't pay his rent, he, he had to go away. And the, 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 um, the landlord destroyed all his films because there was only one copy. But what I'm saying is that those are the sort of films that Industrial Light Magic should be making. So there's dreadful Disney things. These, cheap, they, these, these stories aren't good enough for children. No. I don't they, think so. I truly they're, don't they're, think so. They're, absolutely, they're so slight. They're so full of PC garbage. Uh, their attempts to invade young brains with airsats non-philosophy and, uh, you know, to try and create a pacified generation of uh, p- permanently smiling idiots. Yeah. And that's what you've got. So I do think there's a, in the proper sense of the word, a revolutionary potential in magic. But, of course, if he does have that, that could explain why you ain't going to hear much about it. Right. Keep plotting. <laughs> to return to the reality, to the to the to the RC. <laughs> I mean, but, but this, but this, but this actually ties into what to what we're talking about because I I do think that there is something deeply you know human, human. <laughs> deeply human to what we're talking about in your book. You say that if the Brotherhood did not exist, we should have to invent it. Yes. Why does this what seem to be the case? Yeah, I, mean, I, I suppose in in the sense it's a kind of inevitable idea, isn't it? Uh, when 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 people ponder change, especially periods where change is happening very quickly or appears to be happening, uh, how many changes are long lasting? How many of them are fundamental? It's very difficult to tell at the time they're happening. But there's always the tendency to to imagine that there's a body of people somewhere who really know what's going on. And the Rosicrucian myth of a secret brotherhood who are rather above the earth but, but care about it and send or inspire teachers. Oh, it could be me, couldn't it? Uh, you know, I could be living proof that such a body exists if you want to think of it that way. I don't think of it that way at all. Uh, but there is, there is something about spiritual community. Uh, there is, the, you know, how links are made and all this sort of thing. So it, I sense that you'd have to invent it because you've got to account for the fact that the reaction to the first stories of Andre was so extra, uh, was so instantaneous and so international and um, to some people shocking. You know, René Descartes, the French philosopher, was arrested in Paris uh, by the Catholic authorities and accused of being a Rosicrucian. Uh, who were thought of as satanic subversives uh, by the Catholic Church and their minions. And Descartes, being a clever bastard, said, how can I be a resolution? Everyone knows they're invisible. That's right. (laughs) So in that sense, there will always be a kind of idea of of a secret brotherhood. The beauty of that story, of course, is that the RC brotherhood is absolutely good they're dedicated to healing above all and relieving the pain of the world they're not interested in personal aggrandizement 
uh, it's, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a cabal of financiers trying to manipulate international currency. Uh, it regards all those things as uh, so much dross. So much dross. What are you, what are you building? What, what, have you found the real goal? You, this is one of the things that's very important in the, in the early manifestos. He makes the distinction between the gold which you'll use as currency and real gold is spiritual transformation. And the person who's obsessed with material things will never understand that, never get it. But that's where the future lies ultimately with the people who are prepared to let go of the glitter and go for the light itself. Absolutely. So these days, would anybody bother to call themselves a Rosicrucian? Should oh, sure. it there's a lot of orders, aren't there? There's um, the one, the San Juan is a big thing in Brazil. Uh, uh, I think it extends into Mexico and Argentina, which was founded by, oh, God, I've, I met the founder's son in Australia two years ago. What's his name? Oh, he knew Crowley. Um, no, I'm sorry, I've forgotten. Anyway, uh, there, are, you know, there are some big Rosicrucian churches there, colourful buildings and so forth. I suppose they call themselves Rosicrucian. Amok people still somehow keeps going. I know they've had some serious eruptions. Gary Stewart, I don't know, who became imperator and got into various kinds of trouble. And I think the movement split, but I think it's still going, isn't it, Amor? Quite, quite. Amor, oh yes, definitely. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I've met some Amor people who are lovely. Isn't they? I think one of the first things I did, when I first got the in impulse when I was about 16, I remember writing to Amor. And they sent me all this bump for that, that I could talk to my friends telepathically. And I thought, well, why do I need to? I've got a telephone. <laughs> and uh, there was, a, and I read the stuff, and I could say, you know, I, I, I thought, mm, yes, yes, ancient Egyptians, mm, yeah, yeah, Isaac Newton, yes, the wise men linked by kind of spiritual connection, yeah, okay, yeah. What, are you telling me they're all enamel? <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's just, it was, it, he, he was an advertising man, Harvey Spencer Lewis, very clever, very clever operator. But he did bring to people who'd never have heard of it aspects of this tradition, the uh, same way as the uh, Manly P. Hall repopularized the secret symbols of the Rosicrucians, which are about the Altona book, which was a very important book. But it's got to be said that these books don't really get you to the heart of it. But they do fill your imagination with wonder. Who was that other writer? Is it Ed, Edgar Case? Uh, Paul Foster Case. Paul Foster Case. Yes, the yeah. uh, builders of the Aditum. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, he he created a kind of neo Rosicrucianism, didn't he? Yeah. And I think I think Michael Bajant of the Holy Blood was a member of that. Yeah. So, yeah. I, 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 anyone. Can, I mean, it's always been a, a, a slight temptation of my own to set up a Gnostic church. And I thought, well, why be one among so many? So I always said, look, the Gnostic church exists, except, except no one knows where it is. And that's what Andre said. He said that he, he remembered this, that the original brothers of the RC fraternity meet in the house of the Holy Spirit. And though many see it every day, they do not know of its existence. I mean, this is pure allegory. Of course it's invisible. It, the, the truth is invisible to the worldly eye. The materialist cannot see the value of any of this sort of thing. So the holy house, of course, the, ha the house of the Holy Spirit is where people meet in the spirit, as we're, we're flirting with at the moment. Yes. So there's your house, and then the, the, the temple is cosmic. You know, the, the universe is too small to house the, ch the true church. Right. Uh, you, you could uh, travel as far as you like. You won't find the walls or the windows, but the light is there, traveling at 186,000 miles per second. Hmm. Fantastic. <laughs> I think that is a great note to end. I have had such a wonderful time. This is this has been such an amazing conversation. I'm just going to get a little bit nostalgic. When I was younger, I had about two television stations every once in a while we'd get a third station that would come out from the u.s and they would play documentaries from england uh, as well as things like faulty towers and blackadder 
Great and my, my dad would tape them and he taped a four part documentary series called Gnostics. Oh, wow. And oh, well, that, was, that was my, uh, <laughs> And I would watch them over and over again, not just because they had Brian Blessed in them, who was also in Blackadder, but uh, I just yeah, absolutely right. loved them. You really believed in that. I, I, he really did. You really believed he really was the, uh, was, yeah, was. Together in a hotel in Carcassonne. Uh, that's right. Uh, beautiful weather. And I had a wonderful time talking. And we were going to make a song about William Blake together. He was going to play the part of Blake. That would have been and amazing. The, the, the guy who was backing it at Channel 4, who backed the Gnostics, suddenly fell out with Channel 4, left, and the new people that came in wanted nothing to do with this stuff. Terrible. And Terrible. that was the end of my TV career, pretty well. Wow. You know, it all rested on there being the right person, the right place at the right time, but I actually got in touch with him again uh, a few weeks ago. I hadn't spoken to him for 30 years. And, my goodness. Uh, and... Uh, and we had a wonderful meeting in, in London. And I don't know. I didn't ask him, did he regret leaving? Because I said, I just said, when you left, John, that was the end of it. Yeah. A, a door closed, a major door. The very fact that you saw that in Canada. Yeah. I'm not telling that. If I speak to him next, I'm going to mention that. Please do. Yeah. You know, because um, you would think that, I, I mean, I did the book of that and it became a number two bestseller in England. Yeah. Number two in the country. I was 26 when I wrote that. Jeez. And uh, and I never not, I never got another uh, major. I got one more. They gave me one more film for Channel Four. That's right, which was a subject they chose. Wasn't so particularly well. a doctrine in the Church of England. Well, I tried to make it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was cut in half and put out at the wrong time and all, all this sort of stuff. But, right. um, they wanted to do gospel programs. Less gospels, more Gnostics. I say. Let's talk about what uh, you just released a book, another another Alistair Crowley book, Alistair Crowley in England. Um, that's that's out. Tell us a little bit about this uh, about this work and a previous book, uh, the uh, Lost Pillars of of Enoch as well. Yes, and there's two more to come. Uh, more to come, which, which I've written. Uh, the two more I've written and they come out this, at the end of this year and then next year. Nice. Uh, why do I do so many books? Why do you do so many books, Tobias? I got it. Uh, because life is short, that's why. If I don't get it out now, I won't get another chance. Uh, I just feel that. Although I want to do, I do want to do. I, I want to. I look, this, I've just finished my twenty seventh, twenty seventh book, twenty seventh book, which seems a good number, three nights. And I, I want to do TV presenting. I want to present uh, mainstream programs on interesting religious subjects. I should have been doing it years ago, but it just didn't work out. I don't, I don't even know if it'll work out now, but we'll see how it goes. And that's what I'd like to be doing. But yeah, the new, well, the new book is the, the the one that's just come out in January was Alistair Crowley in England, which is takes his story of the last uh, 20 years of his life from 1932 to, to 1947, not even 20, literally, from after he's has to get out of Germany because the Nazis are moving in. In '32, it comes back to um, comes back to England, suffers poverty in London, meets Frida Harris, and then his wartime experience, which is amazing to go into, yeah. and then his very his brief retirement at Netherwood in Hastings. He's a he's a very lovable and and what's the, the, the little word? Um, there's a pathos. There's a pathos about Alistair Crowley at this period of his life. And, uh, uh, he's not. He's not full of himself, and, yeah. but he's still. He's still very wise, and uh, and, and fun. Yeah. <laughs> so it was said in his life, never dull where Crowley is. Never so, dull. Which is why I've enjoyed writing the book so much, because to write about Crowley is always, uh, uh, always been, not only constantly revealing, mm-hmm. and very wise and, and fascinating, and and really getting to the heart of things, but. He's fun to be with. He's yeah. very good. He's there in anybody else. I've written biographies. I tell you, he's the best fun to be with. He's a delightful traveling companion. Right. <laughs> and uh, so, and I've done one more, which will come out uh, at the end of this year. Is there a title for this one? Yes, it's called uh, They Are Telling You for the First Time. There we it's go. Alistair Crowley in Paris. Alistair Crowley in Paris. Still yeah, in Paris. I didn't realize, my God, this was something that hadn't been researched by anybody. No. Any depth. 
He spent a huge part of his adult life in Paris. It's major. Yep. And the people he knew, oh, to research this was almost everything that I found was new. It hadn't been published. Really? Oh, my God. I mean, it turns out that two of his, two of his lovers were the, uh, one became the wife, uh, wife of Leo Stein. That's Gertrude Stein. Right. He was the one who discovered Picasso, Matisse, promoted Leo Stein. And he was basically picking up Alistair Crowley's girlfriends after, after you know, when he wasn't around. <laughs> and he married one. But it, it was an amazing bit of recent research, uh, not by me, I should add, that, that discovered that, in fact, it, nobody had realised the connection between a lady uh, Crowley mentioned called Nina Olivier, a model. Turns out that was only her model name. In fact, she became Mrs. Leo Stein. <laughs> Uh, so you've got Crowley in the in the midst of the height of artistic. Uh, all this has been suppressed by the myth uh, again. The myth of Crowley. Right. Now talk about myth in the negative sense. The Crowley myth has been utterly devastating on Crowley's real value. It's wiped him out as a personality, as a human being, as an artist, as a poet, every, and and certainly as a philosopher and as a religious philosopher. Uh, the myth has has just you know really really wiped out. And you can, we can point the finger. We know who, who did some of the worst things on him. His dear friend, John Simons, the Simons, author yeah. of The Great Beast. But you just try and make a film about Crowley today, and the only Crowley they want to hear about is, oh, we, you know, the beast and devil, the sex magic, which they presume. They want Cicely Crowley. That's, that's the they one want, they want. They want pornography is what they want. Yeah. That's really it. To, to Crowley, you know, I, I always thought Bob Guccione made a good choice to do Caligula for his pop, for his right. pop because, I mean, Caligula really was pornographic. It was. <laughs> it, yeah, it didn't have to invent anything. No. <laughs> Wonderful. Tobias, where can people find your find your work? A dustbin, I should think. No, absolutely not. They're on my bookshelf. <laughs> exactly. They can come and visit you. No, where... Look, I have a website called TobiasCherton.com, and uh, it has all the books, and you can order them through Amazon or Barnes and Noble, or uh, or any respectable bookshop. I know there's some unrespectable bookshops that probably have them as well. Perfect. Uh, those are the ones I like, of course. Um, I know there's one in Vancouver that that that, that has, has made a point of having some of my books, but if you can't find one of my books, you shouldn't even be looking for. Them. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I will have a link to Tobias's website up in the show notes at whatmagicisthis.com. There's some pretty interesting show notes uh, for this one. Please look through them if this kind of thing is very interesting to you. Those can be found at whatmagicisthis.com. Also there you can find a link to my Twitter account as well as my Instagram account and my Facebook account. If you like the show, please tell a friend about the show. and Perhaps they'll tell a friend and that's how this whole word of mouth thing gets going. If you also enjoy the podcast, why not leave a review for me on either iTunes or Stitcher or even there's a star clicky thing on Spotify. On iTunes, it would be greatly appreciated because uh, you can write a little something about me. You know, you don't have to go crazy, not paragraphs upon paragraphs. One or two or three or four sentences, that's all I ask. That's going to be wonderful. Though somebody from Ireland left a very long, very nice review. So uh, thank you so much, who, uh, whoever did that. Really appreciate that. And uh, yes, but if you enjoy the show please leave a review. Uh, do you think that what I'm doing here at What Magic Is This is in some way kind of important or special or you just want to show your support? There's three ways of doing that. Um, they're all fun, but uh, let's go through them. The very first way of supporting the show is through Patreon. I keep talking about my Patreon. I think my Patreon is awesome. It's basically almost like a totally different show from the show that I have here on this podcast, the main podcast, where I talk through certain uh, deities or saints. I go through the kind of magic that I that I really enjoy. I uh, go, have some videos about how to make incense and how to create an ancestral altar or how to do a fire cleanse. It gives you access to a Discord server. I do stuff about books because everybody loves the books. Everybody says, Doug, you got so many great things about books in your podcast. And I was like, wow, I actually talk about specific books in my Patreon. So my Patreon is only $7 a month. That's nothing. That's it. That's only one tier there. $7 a month. That is 
the price of, I don't know, three bags of candy. Um, it's the price of a, a cold beer at a upscale hipster bar. I don't know. Where are people drinking these days? Are people even drinking these days? Who knows what's popular? It's the price of a secondhand, really shitty deck of tarot cards. It's $7. That's it. That's all I ask. It gives you so much exclusive content. And yeah, I'm, I've said it before. I'll say it again. It is pretty much my favorite stuff that I do. I love talking to people like Tobias. I love the episodes where I kind of do like the tutor thing. I love my solo episodes, but my episodes on Patreon, they're about things like the Higromantia and Grimoires and Spirits and all of that great, great stuff. So $7 a month, that's my pitch. Either you support the show or you don't. Patreon.com slash what magic is this? I would love to see you there because uh, yes, that's that's where my that's where my real heart is. My heart is in this show as well, but uh, my true heart and uh, the, the more Doug aspect of what magic is this comes out more so in my Patreon. So Patreon.com slash what magic is this, or head to what magic is this and click on any one of the numerous Patreon buttons there. If you just want to send me, say like five bucks or ten bucks or twenty bucks or even a thousand dollars, I have PayPal me links all over what magic is this as well. Just uh, click those double P's and uh, yeah, donate. That money goes straight back into keeping the fires on at what magic is this. Uh, it's uh, it's not cheap. Um, I just got hit with another big bill here, <laughs> literally this morning, right before recording. It's like, oh, wow, that's that's a lot of money to keep that thing going. So uh, that's all the money that's donated through PayPal goes straight back into helping this podcast and keeping it running. So that would be appreciated any amount. Truly any amount is appreciated. But unfortunately, with the PayPal, you don't get access to my uh, exclusive content that's on Patreon. The third way is showing your support by buying a t-shirt or a mug or a sticker or a tote bag or even a notebook from my merch store. Head to whatmagicisthis.com. Go to the top right. Click the menu button. Go down to merchandise. There's tons of stuff there. People really love the t-shirts. They look great. I do all the designs of the logos. I just came up with a new logo yesterday, and uh, it should be up in the store sometime here in the next week or two. We'll see. But uh, yes, grab yourself a t-shirt. Grab yourself a mug. They're wonderful. I am my favorite uh, customer because I have a ton of my stuff and it kind of annoys my friends when I just keep wearing my stuff. But you know what? Um, They should support me. And uh, the ones that say... They don't. uh, They're not my friends anymore. Anyways, a bit of a tangent, but yes, uh, grab some merch if uh, if you so find it necessary. But the place I really want to see you is Patreon. That's it. Seven dollars a month. That is all I am asking. All of these things are available though at whatmagicisthis.com. So head there for all of your what magic is this needs. Just to let everybody know, we've scratched the surface with the Rosicrucians. We we put it in pretty good order here. Tobias set us all straight, but please pick up the invisible history of the Rosicrucians. It is a wonderful book. It is the authority book on Rosicrucians and Rosicrucianism. And and I'd say something else. Looking back over the many years since I wrote it, I would say first of all, it is not out of date at all. Not a bit. It, it hasn't aged. I have a little. But I'm getting better with all. There you go. Um, but there is a real spiritual vibe from it. There is I, when I, I last time I read, I thought, like, God, this is getting very close to the the beauty, the beauty stuff, the stuff that will elevate you truly. So sure. it, there it is. There's, there's, my interest in the story was to reveal the spirit behind, not the myth in front. Wonderful. Couldn't have done it better. And uh, yeah, th- this book has it all. It was. My first time going through it was just like, oh, here, here it all is. Finally, that's actually the word that I had. It's like finally, this book. When you see it, yeah. yeah. When you see the facts, it makes sense. It's yeah. yeah. You don't need you don't need the fairy story anymore. No, absolutely you got, not. You got the gem. Yeah. I wish I had a time machine. I want to go. <laughs> and, I want to film the resurrection. <laughs> Other people, uh, I want to go find Jack the Ripper. No, no. Tobias Jordan to the resurrection. <laughs> first things first. First yeah. things first. First things first. <laughs> Tobias, this has been so much fun. I, I would hope that if I was to ask you to come back on What Magic Is This some point in the future, you'd be agreeable to do so because I've, I've had such a great time. Excellent.
Well, it's been, it's, I've enjoyed it too. Fantastic. And that's the show, everybody. And uh, come on back to uh, What Magic Is This? We'll talk about more of this wonderfully invisible part of a brotherhood that may not be a brotherhood stuff that we like to call Western esotericism and magic. Until then, I want each and every one of you to stay healthy, stay hopeful, and stay luminous. We will talk at you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Bye-bye.